for helping me welcome our guest today, Michael Bricker, who is the production designer on this, uh, on this uh, television show. Uh, in our conversation tonight, I kind of want to keep us uh, circling around kind of three larger themes as we kind of go through this, um, which are collaboration for first, the first one, second one, the relationship between design and character, mm -hmm. and the last one is kind of building both the real and surreal components of the story and how to like, kind of walk that line. Those are good ones. Okay. Right. And, uh, and I'll also just say, and I, this was mentioned in the opening too, that you know, this is part of our special effects series. One of our earlier guests was kind of talking about special effects this defined it as anything within on the screen that sort of increases the illusion. Mm. Uh, and I think that your production design really does a lot to kind of increase the illusion that goes on in, mm. the, in, the, in the show. So to start, can you just talk a little bit about when you joined the production process for Russian Doll? And how fully fleshed were the physical spaces of the story world uh, when you pitched your vision of the show? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think I pitched in um, maybe September or October, and we started shooting uh, the following February. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I pitched um, by Skype, you know, uh, with me in one bubble and Natasha in another and Leslie Hedlund in another one. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, pitching by <laughs> Skype is always a little, you know, weird, weird yeah. <laughs> still. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I put together this kind of pitch for the show and, and, you know, sometimes those rare moments where you're like, I, I really, I nailed that, you know, and yeah. it doesn't mean you're going to get the job, but I was like, I, I really, I crushed that. Uh, and then I didn't hear anything for two months, you know, Oof. even like emailing my agent, like, hey, what's going on, you know, because yeah. um, I did really want the job. Um, and then, you know, two months later, out of the blue, you know, they said that I got it. Um, and so uh, then I yeah, started in New York um, the following February. And did so. they have strong ideas for what they thought about the physical spaces or did you just get kind of a, a script and not much description? On, I only had the pilot okay. um, and the pilot was um, a little bit different than, than kind of where it finished. Sure. Um, and, but the script, the, the script definitely had a few kind of um, uh, clues, you know, which, which helped my pitch, but also kind of helped the kind of beginning um, the shaping at the beginning of the world, you know, so um, the bathroom was described as kind of like a, a spa bathroom in the script and, mm -hmm. and, you know, somewhere it said she kind of, you know, leaves the, the rabbit hole um, was like a line in, in an early description. And then, um, you know, the gun handle and the artwork on the bathroom door were also kind of in the scripts. But other than that, that was about it. Yeah. Um, but but in reading that pilot, there were just enough really, really, really subtle references that I thought were to Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the, the story is not a take on Alice in Wonderland in any way. Um, but I felt like there's something interesting about that as a, as a, as a visual anchor. Mm -hmm. So that's how I pitched it. And I just, you know, I said, as soon as she leaves the bathroom, um, she's entering Wonderland, mm -hmm. uh, which means the rules of reality are, are um, dishonest, yeah. you know, uh, and so that that was kind of my initial hook and, and pitch to them. And then I think they I remember Natasha, I think she said in the interview, she was like, we didn't know that the story was capable of this, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, and so I think I like to think I helped kind of push them to to bend the rules of the world as they were writing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, for those who aren't quite as familiar with the job of a production designer, can you just give us a brief overview of kind of the crew members and the creative mm -hmm. teams that you have the most contact with as you're going through the design process? And uh, who are kind of your, your primary collaborators on the design of the spaces that we see on screen? Yeah, so I, you know, I kind of at the top level, I interact with the cinematographer and the director. Mm -hmm. um, and the three of us are really shaping the, the, the world. You know, um, and then uh, so I'm pitching kind of higher level concepts, but then also kind of how those concepts can be built on time and on budget and 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 kind of all the realities that go along with production. Um, and so then that kind of I have to filter that and translate that message down to the locations manager who's finding all the locations, um, the art director who's managing construction and paint and, set, and the set designers that are drawing the sets. Um, as well as the set decorator who is 
uh, sourcing all of the things that go in the in the spaces, sure. um, and then the property master. So those are kind of the key um, the keys that report to me, and so yeah. I have to make sure that they all uh, get along, <laughs> and that I'm clear in communicating what's important when, yeah. um, and and. Uh, and so that when when they come together, that a prop feels like it's in the same universe as yeah. the living room, as the location. Yeah. So it's all, you're trying to kind of communicate a common vision that yeah. they all are working on. Yeah. You also just hearing you describe it, it sounds like you're kind of the conductor of the orchestra, trying to make sure that everybody's yeah I'll coming take, in at the I'll right. I'll take vibe. that reference. Sure. Okay. Fair that enough. Sounds nice. Yeah. Um, so I want to turn a little bit to some of the spaces. I want to start actually with Nadia's apartment, which is you yeah. know not as central to the whole sure. thing, but um, there are some small design elements that seem to both kind of fit mm -hmm. her nihilistic character and also seem to comment on the events that are actually kind of occurring to her. Yeah. So you've got kind of the life is killer yes. and wake up um, signs that are on the walls. Uh, did you collaborate with Natasha Leone on selecting the items that yes. are in Nadia's apartment? And how do you want those conversations about character and environment to kind of go when you're trying to develop these spaces? Yeah, so she, with the artwork in particular, in, in, in many of the locations, she had some ideas, and mm -hmm. actually Life is a Killer is in the script, huh. um, which is, the, I think, the only piece of art that was like specifically mentioned in the script, so we had to, had to really try to get that, yeah. which was not easy. <laughs> um, but we, but we got it. Uh, and, but she was also really helpful, particularly in the loft. Like she's, she has, she just, you know, bleeds New York. Like she just, mm. she knows that community, that creative community there so well. Sure. And so she, you know, she was having me go to like secret art studios and openings and yeah. like introducing me to some of her friends. And we try to, um, kind of incorporate some of their artwork into, into the world. Um, Partially because she was asking, you know, but also that yeah. that she, it was help. It's just another layer of authenticity that's getting in, injected in, into the world. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the challenge with her apartment was like she in some ways she I think was expecting me to create like her apartment that I've never been to. OK, <laughs> Yep. you yep. know, so so and, and it's a deeply personal project for her. Obviously, so how could yeah, she yeah, not yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. like kind of walk into that space and think like, well, where, why doesn't this look like my yeah, place? Yeah. You know, so we, we talked about that a lot and, and I had, I had kind of an, uh, a map of where all the locations fit within the visual logic of the world. Sure. And so her, her space kind of had to follow certain rules, mm -hmm. um, uh, within the world, but then also needed to be authentic for her character, you yeah. know? So we had a lot of music around, we had a lot of books around, like she's kind of a reluctant, a reluctant academic, you know, she's clearly mm -hmm. really intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, she likes games, you know, and gaming and, yeah. and puzzles. And so we wanted to make sure that the space felt um, intelligent, mm -hmm. ironic, you know, mm -hmm. and um, chaotic, you know? So I yeah. think, I think, I think we did it. Yeah, we did yeah. all right. And, and th that place actually was, we've, uh, the before photos of that space are pretty remarkable because it, it's completely different except for that like weird cat tree uh -huh, that is sure. like sitting behind her sofa. And that was like the one thing we kept from the people who live there. That's funny. Yeah. I had it removed and then it felt like it was missing. And I was like, can we bring the cat tree back in? And... <laughs> that's the one thing you need to <laughs> so, say. That's great. Yeah. That's I great. think it's the only plant actually that's in the show, sure. you know, because I had all the plants removed from everywhere. Yeah. So. Um, well, then I want to also turn to Maxine's apartment, obviously, which yeah. which is an even more central space for the show. Um, it also seems like kind of a more interesting challenge in terms of character, simply because Maxine's character is more of a side character who's yeah. a little bit less explored yeah. in the narrative, but her home space is, you know, again, very very important. So did you need to develop a deeper sense of Maxine as a character than what actually appears in the series in order to design her home space? Or was the fact that she's kind of less explored as a character give you more freedom to build her apartment towards narrative goals, hmm. towards kind of the world building goals? Does yeah. that free you up in that way? Yeah, you know, the, the apartment had to, had, a, had to pull a lot of weight in the story. Yeah. And Maxine as a character was kind of only a piece of that. Um, we wanted... You know, the script was helpful in this regard because it said that it was it was her place. She was an artist, you know, um, and so we kind of we 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 actually kind of said that since there's a line, I think, in one of the episodes where she said she's made the door. She's collaborated yes. with someone to make yeah, the yeah. door. So we we're like, OK, well, we need to make 
the living room I had this idea that she's or she, that she's turned the dining room into her art studio mm -hmm. and so then we once we made the door we went back and put work and materials in the dining room that look like the door sure. um, so we tried to have a little bit of a, a narrative that she's kind of an artist that's interested in like ar architectural um, relics and remnants materials. and and kind of built out the space that way yeah. and then the script also mentioned that she was kind of like a, a fan of the art scene and so the artwork is like some of it's hers some of it's her friends like she's mm -hmm. just kind of like you know a new york artist and she's been doing it for a while so yeah, we yeah. wanted we wanted it to the, the loft to feel evident of that yeah but then i i really thought that that the, the layout of the loft um really came from how many times the audience was going to see her resetting and walking through it yeah, of course. and so what well, we started designing it without all the scripts but we knew obviously that she was going to be coming back. Know, coming back yeah <laughs> and that that we wanted that to be exciting for the audience so mm -hmm. you know there's a whole bunch of ideas kind of quickly went into the design of the loft one one being that it, it actually is designed as a set of concentric rings and so the her, her and it's designed in terms of her path instead of walls so like how she leaves the apartment um, she can leave it in kind of these these increasingly tighter rings so as she realizes that she just needs to get out of there she can beeline it to the front door yep. um, and then actually as she starts crossing with Alan, um, all, of her all of her initial turns to leave are to the right. And so we had this idea that Nadia is right and Alan is left. And so when she's, she starts crossing with Alan, she takes a left out of the bathroom and goes out the fire escape. So that's mm -hmm. like her moving from the right to the left. Mm -hmm. um, and then Alan and what we just saw, you know, he's making a choice and going from the left to the right. So he, he usually takes the left elevator and he decides to take the right. Mm -hmm. um, and those were things that were not in the script. Those were things that, that I injected into the story saying like, let's start having these really subtle rules on even where the characters occupy the frame. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, that, so to the apartment, like how she leaves beca became really important. And then the other thing that was really important is I wanted the audience to feel like there was always a space that they haven't seen. Mm. Um, and so we, we kind of intentionally left these like closets and doors and, and shoot offs that you, you kind of feel like, like there's like in a, the map of video, a video game, there's parts that are unexplored, mm -hmm. you know, and that, you know, if she went that way, maybe she wouldn't die, <laughs> you know? So um, all of that, believe it or not, was intentionally kind of planned yeah. into the floor plan of the loft. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wonder, too, there's another question I have in here that's about, you know, kind of designing for character versus designing for camera movement. Yeah. And the ways in which the camera actually navigates the space. Yeah. And are you often limited by that? I mean, do you design, do you ever design a space and then figure out, like, actually, we can't move around in here in the way that we need to be able to move around in here, so we have to redesign it? Yeah, I've, I almost always start with camera movement okay because that if the camera can't see it then why is it like it, yeah. yeah i mean so and 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 i i think that's maybe a bit unusual you know um but i'm always thinking about what where where can the camera go how far can it see or not far mm -hmm. you know um how many layers of space does it reveal and when does it reveal those things so right. like so that's why like when um the bathroom door opens and you look straight down the hallway you can see through a series of spaces but you can't see the entire space so there's a wall in the dining room that cuts off that site so it the audience gets the sense that you're you're seeing a lot because you're seeing deep but you're not seeing much of anything so the camera actually has to move through the space to explore it yeah. um, so in that regard then as a designer i actually get to dictate where the camera can go mm. um, and not go you yeah. know which yeah. which sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't you know sometimes a director or dp will come in and say actually this all looks great but we need to be able to put the camera over here so you need to we need to cut a hole in that wall you know yeah. which sometimes we do yeah yeah well kind of speaking of cinematography lighting obviously is typically the responsibility of the dp or yeah. cinematographer uh, and their team but colored lights in the show become kind of an overwhelming element of the design mm -hmm. at times. Um, there's that deep blue in the mm -hmm. bar back room where she meets mm -hmm. War Dog. Nadia's apartment windows are kind of suffused with green light from the outside. Yeah. There are the red lights over her while she freezes to death in the yeah. park. Um, 
were the lighting shades part of the script? Were they part of your design? Um, and are they trying to convey something specific to the viewers? Um, a little bit. I mean, we, the, me and the cinematographer talked a lot about color and, and colored light. And, and so I, I'd say that was like kind of a full on collaboration with him, Chris mm -hmm. Teague. Um, but I do think that there was, we, I did kind of set a design rule as it related to saturation. Mm -hmm. And so the, the closer, the closer Nadia is to the cent to the loft, basically geographically, um, the more saturated the color. Mm -hmm. So like her apartment's fairly close, mm -hmm. the bar is fairly close. Mm -hmm. Um, but as she starts to move away from her path, you know, like when she goes to Beatrice's apartment, the color drains. So that yeah. space is almost completely black and white. Her yeah. office is completely, almost completely black and white. Um, and there's kind of, a, there actually is a kind of a gradation in between. And we, we again, plotted all of these locations um, radiating out from the loft. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Chris and um, Jen, the costume designer, they, we had to move so quickly on this show that that just became like a very simple concept that the other creative departments could just be like, okay, great, thanks. Like, we'll run with that, you yeah. know? So the three of us really kind of went into lock, lockstep with that rule so, yeah. so that, uh, the, again, the costumes and the lighting um, have this kind of, yeah, desaturation depending on where we are. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. In the temple, too. I didn't realize that until... Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the synagogue's kind the of in a halfway yeah. point, okay. you know? Okay. Um, and... Uh, yeah, That's like cool. we, we really did kind of map it out. And so I'd be like, oh, there's too much color in there, you know, or right. we need to put a little more back in. Did so. you have some sort of like, uh, you know, notepad that had all the rules that you were following in the show? Like a Bible yeah. for the whole show? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we had like, we had a spreadsheet. Uh -huh. So the first, my first week on the job, I just took post-it notes and I, and every post-it was like a half hour. And I just started saying, like, this is where she is every yeah. half hour. Yeah. And this is how she dies. And then and then I would just do it for all of her lives. And mm -hmm. then when we we learned after we started a little bit that Alan was a character and that Alan was dying at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I mapped out his and like yeah. was also started to work with the writers and saying well if she's here and he's here like that doesn't make sense like mm -hmm. how are they both dying at the same yeah. time yeah. um and so that that logic board got translated into we called them loops and that got translated into a digital version of that that a couple other people started managing because yeah. it was really complicated because sure. we also shot out of order yeah. um and then i had a version of that that was simplified for the art department that had to do with when things started disappearing, decaying, you know, like that kind of um, glitching of the world. We had yeah. a document that was specifically for that because I can't be there all the time and the art sure. department that's on set has to know for which scene, you know, are the flowers alive or are they dead? Or are they somewhere in between, you know? How many fish are in the tank? Yeah, how many yeah. fish are in the tank? Like how, and we, we had a document that mapped out all, yeah. you know, down to these are the art pieces that stay. These are the art pieces that go away. Yeah. Um, since the animals, the, the fish and the cat are the first things to disappear, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a round where anything that's animal-like or animal artwork disappears. That's actually the first thing oh, to wow. disappear, I think, in the second episode that yeah, yeah. no one probably notices. Yeah. Um, but there was like, there's like a rabbit lamp and a, oh, and a yeah, yeah. you know, a, a you know, a stuffed fox, you know, sure. and, and, you know, fuzzy blanket and all those things went, you know, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to go to the song. Can I talk about the music too? Cause that's also another crucial part. So the song that plays each time that mm -hmm. Nadia resets, um, it becomes such a crucial part of the viewing mm -hmm. experience. Was that something that you knew was coming when you guys, like what, when did that enter into the process of designing? Um, and did it, you know, did you choose it to match up with that first long journey through the apartment space? The music isn't, that's, I think that song was in the script, uh -huh. um, but that's not really my zone. I mean, okay. they, like, I think other than me knowing that was the song, it, it's not, we maybe had, maybe someone did make a little playlist because there were a few songs that were, that were pulled out, but yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't actually, I didn't think about it. It's also really striking when Alan does his loops. It's like, it's like classical, classical music. music. Yeah. It's very mannered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It also uh, is another sly comment on the characters, which yeah. is great. 
All right, so we've been talking around this a bunch, but you know, balancing the desire to build spaces that are both kind of like reality um, and also spaces that end up being kind of unrealizable and that are uh, kind of unnatural. Uh -huh. And so kind of as you're thinking about that in, in this show, how did you walk that line between building spaces that are very much a part of the mm -hmm. world that we exist in yeah. and also that are falling rules that are very much a, not a part of that uh, kind of world that we live in right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I took, this is my first TV show that I've ever done, Russian Doll, and, and I just kind of told myself, like, just make the choices that make you uncomfortable, okay. you know? So I definitely personally came at it as like, just like, you know, when you're choosing between a couple of things, like choose the one that you're like, uh, that makes uh, me uneasy, but let's yeah, yeah. do that. Um, so I, I did that. And then, and then I think, um, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think that having a few, it's in a way it's a bit scientific, but having a few rules for the universe was really helpful yeah. and setting those up early on, you know, my brain, initially was like we have to follow the rules like all the time mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. and like our producer called me like the loop police you know and yeah. what i learned on this job from natasha and leslie specifically is they they kind of knew when to say like okay just shut up let you know go. like let it go yeah. and i think that that tension between the kind of rules embedded into the design um relaxing occasionally for character for camera or something that's funnier yeah. you know is why the show feels magical mm -hmm. instead of sci-fi right and and i i really i learned a lot from that i'm like no like when you're thinking about design or thinking about the rules of you of the universe knowing when to break the rules that you've set up or relax the rules a little bit it doesn't mean the whole thing collapses yeah. um, and potentially can make it a little bit stronger. And I think that that yeah. maybe happened here. And it seems like you're saying they're always asking for that relaxation in the service of the show or in the Absolutely. service of comedy or yeah. in the service of, yeah, yeah. That, that totally makes sense. Yeah. It also sounds like you're Alan in this whole scenario. I mean, maybe, yeah, I, I could relate to Alan for sure, <laughs> <Fair> yeah. <enough. laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, again, we've been talking about this a bit, but I, I'm curious about when or how did you want viewers to start catching on that Nadia's loops are not without consequence in the world? Right. Because that's something that takes a little while to be fully revealed. Yeah. Um, so did you have a kind of a moment or a way in which you wanted viewers to start to piece that together? I think that, I, I think this, the scripts were, were really good. And I think the scripts, they, they helped with that a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, and they really kind of mapped out where some of those kind of like, like key, key moments, uh, narrative moments are where the story kind of like, you feel like it just rotates a notch or something, you know, it just yeah. shifts a little bit. Yeah. Um, and what, and this, and, and the glitching ramps up near the end, you know, yeah. as well. But we, you know, like I was saying, like we tried to map out what all those potential changes would be. Yeah. And Leslie and I talked a lot about actually making a lot of those changes happen early on because yeah. like with this you're so locked into watching natasha like she's just so watchable yeah. that you actually we got away with so ch we changed so much really yes okay and and i just don't think the audience they by the time they clock it like it's we have been changing it for a long time right yeah you know and and on the one hand, I could say like it was definitely planned and calculated because it really was. But on the other hand, I just feel like it just somehow it just it worked. Yeah, it it, it worked. You yeah. know, because the end of that second episode when she's like, "We're going to be here forever. This is the greatest yeah. party ever," and yeah. then you see the plan start to wilt. Yeah, sort of like what is going on? I know. Um, and obviously, it's an incredibly rewatchable show yeah. that it gains you know enjoyment with each of the uh, reviewings. Um, so I want to, we've been talking a little bit about Alan too, but I want to talk a little bit about Alan uh, more directly. End of the third episode, obviously we meet him, who becomes the series' second central character. Yeah. Um, his personality and his birth and death routine are significantly different than Nadia's. So how did you think about the spaces you were designing mm -hmm. for Alan, uh, and how did you want them to resemble or stand apart from apartments like Maxine's or like Nadia's? Yeah. Um, so again, the script was, was pretty helpful or just like gave enough clues, you know, early on. And like the way Alan's apartment was described is that he bought everything from Ikea. Um, yep. So did we. Uh, <laughs> yep. And, uh, and, and so we, 
So we needed, the challenge of his space is it needed to appear as an opposite to Maxine's, but also as an opposite to Nadia's. To Nadia's, you're right, yeah. And because Nadia's and Alan's apartments kind of on our like map are in the same place. Mm. Um, the, the loft is still, you know, at the center. But what's significant is that, you know, Alan is, he's resetting in his own place and she's re resetting in Maxine's Somebody loft. So yeah. those bathrooms have some sort of like cosmic tension. So as soon as, as soon as we learned that he was, he existed as a character and was also resetting in his bathroom, I was like, we have to build these bathrooms back to back. Mm. Um, so that, so the split screen shots that they did are practical. Those bathrooms really were built back to back. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so you, you, you see really what's important about his world versus her world is all kind of captured in that shot where, you know, he's on, or she's on the right, he's on the left, she's dark, he's light, she's warm, he's cold, yep. you know, um, the music, you know, yep. and, and, and it just shows they're just, their polarities that mm. somehow have this thread that connects them you know they're, they're not they're people i think what's so satisfying about their relationship is there are people that just would never cross paths they have nothing in common and yet somehow you know you know as they're walking on the street one day something someone just did something they weren't supposed to do or you know we saw in the deli someone made a choice that they weren't supposed to make yeah. and it and it linked them and i think you know, one of the reasons why people respond to the show and, and to their relationship is like when you're walking around in the city, you you know, we all walk past someone and, we, and we're like, man, what is up with that person? Like, yeah. I want to know more about them. I, I, I want to stop and say something. I like what they're wearing. Or, there's so many things that we never, we want to say and we don't, yeah. you know, and I think a little bit of the show is about um, kind of what what if you know you allowed yourself to be derailed like yeah. that yeah. um it's both i mean it's a very playful obviously exploration of this you know fantasy world but it also yeah. says something about our responsibilities to each other yeah. right even yeah. as human beings yeah uh, which i think is the way in which i think that comes out in the last few episodes and yeah. deepens kind of the experience of the whole show which has yeah. been yeah. largely kind of playful and totally uh, fantasy like and, exactly which is nice but the stakes that's what's what, what you're saying earlier like they the stakes are real, you yeah, know, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, in a comedy, you don't really expect that, you know, Natasha's character clearly doesn't expect that, right. yeah, you yeah. know, um, and then realizes that, oh, wait, this, there, not only are there consequences for me, but there's consequences for the other people in my life, yeah. you know, um, and her nihilism is so fun in the first couple yeah. episodes, but then it also begins to cost both you and her as it yeah. goes on, which, yeah, is, exactly. which is really lovely. Yeah. She does a great job with it. Yeah. Um, so the, the surreal and kind of puzzly aspects of the show have inspired a degree of kind of obsessive fandom <laughs> that exceeds what we might think of as traditional TV viewership. Yeah. And so I, I was wondering, have you been surprised by the response? Um, were you thinking about people obsessively pausing and rewatching the show while you were planning your designs? Did that sort of factor into how you thought about it? I mean, we, like when we were first shaping the show, like I, we did say we wanted it to be rewatchable mm -hmm. because we liked that it is kind of a puzzle box, you know, that, and that we wanted people to kind of delight in, in catching things. And so like, so I think someone did a Buzzfeed of like 37 things you probably missed, you know, like sure. tracking all the little things and, yeah. and, uh, and they're right. I mean, they, they found a ton of them and there's like a, there's a ton more, you know, that, that I yeah. think people haven't caught, um, uh, so I I am have been completely floored, you know. I mean, this this the show is you know better than I could have hoped for, and that people respond to it and like it is great, and that's usually as far as it goes. But for me, at least, but like that people are also kind of they seem tuned into the design, or at least just the yeah. the kind of shape or color or texture of the world. Like is you know that's not why I did that, and I wasn't trying to like. Um, call attention to that, you know, because, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm actually more interested in, you know, production design as being like subversive so that the audience just falls into the universe. Mm -hmm. um, but f for whatever reason on this, it kind of like both things can be true at the same time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm um, super humbled to have been a part of the project and, and honored that people seem to dig, dig it. Yeah.
Well, I guess I mean, following up on what you said just a moment ago, are there anything that viewers have caught that you thought might stay obscured or anything that you think people have missed that you felt was actually a little more obvious? There's one thing people, there's a, there's one thing people have missed that, that is a mistake that I caught, that like there's a piece of art that disappeared and then came back. Okay. Um, <laughs> Which was unintentional. Yeah, that one wasn't, that one wasn't on purpose. Okay. Um, uh, I can't think of anything specific. Okay, we keep yeah. thinking, if it comes okay. to you at all any right. point while right. we keep talking, you can come back to it. Um, I mean, you, obviously, what we were just talking about is kind of the afterlife of the show uh -huh. uh, and the ways in which the design has become part of a conversation that's a little bit larger uh, than maybe you expected. So I'm wondering, you know, have you been in touch with or, or heard from any of the designers who made components from, like, Maxine's apartment uh, since the show was released? Uh, I, I, again, I'm guessing like the mirror company must be delighted by the fact that it keeps showing up you know, over and over again. <laughs> right. that people were, um, you know, there are articles online of how to recreate the bathroom that she yep. wakes up in over and over again. Yeah. Um, Which that article, I remember seeing that one and my jaw hit the floor because they had the like, here's where, how to make it, make it happen, you know? And like, they said the tile in the bathroom is black and it is not black, no. it is dark green, yeah. you know? So definitely want to correct that one. Yep. Um, but no, I mean, like, I think, you know, some people have reached out um, uh, to me directly and they're just, they, they love some of the artwork. And so they're, they're asking like, who is that artist, you know? And so I, you know, try to connect them um, with, with some of the artists in, in the show. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely come up, but um, anything more specific, I, you know, um, you know, hasn't, hasn't come up directly, but. Um. And then I have just a couple of random questions. Uh, fish tanks play an unexpectedly large role sure, in the yeah, series. That's true. Were they like in the script there as well, or yep. was this an idea of yours? Okay. Yeah. And the fish, fish tanks, there. do they have that exact same blue shade that is like in War Dogs place? Like that? The, no, I don't know. I, yeah. Because I no. felt like that light also echoed back and forth between a few places. I know. And the funny thing is that blue light, blue is actually the only color that wasn't supposed to be in the show. And mm. for some reason, that basement is blue. <laughs> and I, I was talking with the cinematographer about that. And he was like, you know, we tried, it was supposed to be like, all the blues in the show were supposed to be like a cyan, like mm -hmm. a, a sure. kind of shifted blue. And this is where you have to trust your collaborators. He was like, we tried it and just like, they didn't look good. It looked terrible. You know, they just Fair didn't enough. look good. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you're like, then like as a designer, you're like, well, at the, you know, at the end of the day, like, yeah. well, they have to look good, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so he shifted it to, bl to blue and, and it, it totally works, you yeah. know? Um, so there are a few, a few elements of blue in the show and that's one of them. And I think it stands out because there is so little blue in the show. Right. Uh, and I don't have a good reason for that. I think I just said early on, I was like, there's no blue. Just, mm. it doesn't make sense to me in this world. Um, yeah. And everyone kind of went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd go around and be like, get that out of here, <laughs> you know. Amazing, the, the value of following through right, impulses yeah. that, that come up early and yeah. trusting that. That's yeah. great. Something about the title, Russian Doll, it just feels red and green. Red and know? green, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> uh, so the exterior of Maxine's apartment building actually has those peak designs, those peaked windows that also appear yeah. inside of the set, right, yes. inside of the doors. And so I'm wondering, did you find that exterior first and then base the interior design on that? Or were you searching for an exterior based on those peaks that already existed? That was a really tight timeline on that one. Okay. So the, we had a different location that had arched windows. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that location didn't work out for some reason, but we were kind of already down the road on construction or close, I think. Uh -huh. And I had walked past the building that we ended up shooting at. And I was like, I think this would work instead. Better. And it was at the opposite corner of Tompkins Square Park. Okay. Like we really did shoot everything right around Tompkins really? Square okay. Park. Yeah. Um, almost everything, um, which they were, they had had it with us by the end of <laughs> the end of shooting. Um, but I had, I walked over and there was this um, church there um, and it had Gothic. And I actually really didn't want to change it to Gothic because I liked you know, thinking of Alice in Wonderland, I liked that the archway, a regular arch seems more like a rabbit hole a than rabbit a gothic yeah, arch. Sure. So I was really resisting it. And then I was like, we just got to do it. And so we, we got that location. We made all the, the windows in the loft to match. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, and then I was like, we got to make the, the, the hallway out of the bat or in the bathroom mm -hmm. and the door now also gothic. Yeah. And so we, we, we made that adjustment. 
as well. And I've actually grown to really, really like it. I think it's a, I think it's better, you know, because yeah. it adds that Gothic has that kind of sharpness to it and, yeah. and it feels a bit more um, mystical and dangerous. It's what you were saying at the beginning. The show. Yeah, which yeah. is like if it looks a little bit weird and you feel yeah. like a little uncomfortable with it, it works. Yeah. It's actually better. And but I it think was like a really, case. I wish I could remember exactly, but it was something like I called the location manager or something. I was like, we have got to make this choice right now because we are about to spend a ton of money building yeah, this yeah, set yeah. and I cannot move the windows, <laughs> you know? So, yep. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I got one more question, which is um, just kind of a fun one. What is your favorite design element in the show? Uh, was there anything you felt like was a really difficult thing to bring to life that you feel like you ultimately really nailed and the team really pulled together? Um, that's a good question. I think, um, I hate to say the door in a way, but I'm going to say the door sure. because I, I like the story around how we made the door. Tell us. Um, because it it's actually a it's a bit of a puzzle when you really think about what has, what has to happen with that. Like it has to look, it has to look like an art piece. It has to function as the door. It mm -hmm. has to light up, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and then when I added the Gothic arch to it, it has to be a door that fits like, it, like there's some geometry there that actually gets really tricky, believe it or not, that the carpenters figured out. Yeah. Um, and, but with the door itself, like I just, I, I, I kept thinking that it, I wanted it to be galactic mm. and, and celestial and that it felt like she was entering a, a void mm. or an abyss, you know? Um, and, and so when I was working with the scenics and, 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 um, sculptors, everyone was like scratching their heads. They're like, how are we going to do this? Like, this is going to be everyone in New York is like, that's going to cost $20,000, you know? <laughs> and I was like, guys, I really think it's just rift sheets of wax paper. And that's what it is. Wow. It is it is ripped sheets of wax paper. I did the sketch, you know, on mm -hmm. a piece and I ripped a whole and I was like, just keep doing this and do it like, you know, contour lines and topography sure. and then space them, you know, with little spacers. And so uh, that's what it is with, you know, lights in the inside of the door. Yeah. And they brought it in and turned it on and it, and it worked. So I, I, I like that story because it's, it feels like kind of a, my independent filmmaking right roots kind of translating to the new york union <laughs> right right uh and creative everyone, problems yeah and everyone's like oh yeah i guess yeah it just doesn't have to cost twenty thousand dollars you know so that's really cool yeah all right well we've got a little bit of time for audience questions hi, hi. um thanks so much for being here it's absolutely amazing um as i've watched the whole show i wanted to ask something about a more obvious element of um the dying plants and the rotting fruits uh -huh. that the audience is drawn attention to was that something in the script or was that something you came up with about you know the, t the whole story about how when she's looping in more and more things start kind of changing and yeah did you come up with this or was it something that was previously like thought in the script there there are key moments that are scripted you know um and and uh i can't remember specifically but the script would say you know like at the end of episode two you know, there's flowers some wilt. there's some flowers that are wilting, or yeah. or um, you know by you know episode seven, you know almost all the furniture is gone. You know, so there were some clues, but they weren't um, uh, completely mapped out. And so I think we, the art department, then kind of took on that responsibility of really mapping out what would go and when it would go. But and, and part of my dialogue with Les Leslie and Natasha was always like, what, are, what is going on? Rotting, like, yeah. like wilting, yeah. disappearing, like what are the rules here? Yeah. And that's again where they were like, yeah, that's <laughs> what's <question>. happening, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and, and that's, so we really, we treated it as like glitching, like just, it's just glitching, things are not, working right mm -hmm. um but there is a consequence you know and they're they're basically fading or decaying or dying until they disappear completely um and so that was that was the approach we took and it, we, again we did it as this kind of almost like bell curve crescendo so that mm -hmm. you kind of by the time you notice it you're like oh there's a few things happening and then it really just kind of explodes at the very it's end crazy at the end yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, in terms of the exterior locations, did you have any um, uh, uh, influence on choosing 
what locations work best for the script. I know you don't have like a lot of control when it comes to like the streets and stuff, but did you have any um, input on that? Yeah, I mean, I my approach to the designer position is like, I try to take as much control of locations as I can. You know, it, it was challenging on this job, but you know, a lot of what I can do is say, these are the kinds of places that I would like to see, you know? So it's a lot of reference images to the locations manager um, and, and just say, look for this, look for this. And then the locations manager and the scouts come back with a ton of options. And what I try to do is like, I look at those options first before the director and cinematographer do and try to narrow it down. And some, that worked most of the time on this project, not all the time, but, uh, but we, we knew that we really were shooting around Tompkins Square Park. So, you know, when we were struggling to find a place, you know, I would, I would just walk the neighborhood a lot and just, and either pick out a specific place and, you know, take a photo and send it to the location manager or, or um, just use that as inspiration for what, um, what could function as what, you know? Um, and like the exterior of the synagogue isn't where we shot the interior. You know, there's a lot of things that don't match up because of how demanding the schedule was. So you can pick what you want and then there's, and then the schedule arrives and it becomes a whole new sure. puzzle where s certain things have to dictate that. And so you're like, okay, well we can have this one or we can have this one. We're going to pick this one because it's more important, which means we need to find the exterior of whatever within a block or two from here and somehow it has to work. So then that's when I get a bunch of images and they're like, which one do you think works the best? Yeah. And we kind of back into it that way. So, yeah. so many moving parts. And actually I think Alan's apartment, is this? There, oh, Beatrice's apartment and Nadia's apartment are in the same building. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Cool. Fun fact. <laughs> Each of these characters, you know, they're specifically in an art world, you know, and it's not just the, locations that's setting that sort of like theme of who they are. Mm -hmm. What's your involvement with, you know, costuming that's going on? Yeah, I mean, we had an amazing costume designer, Jen Rogian, um, and we, you know, like I was saying, we collaborated a lot at the beginning in terms of palette and texture and, um, uh, I guess, art, 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 artistry, artisticness, you know, um, and, and we connected early on with that. And then, she, you know, she took it from there, like that, that's really kind of its own, own um, department. But what, what I think where you clearly see where she's adopted this notion of like saturation mm -hmm. and desaturation is mm -hmm. like when you look at like Beatrice's costume, you know, she's got like a black cardigan and like no pattern on her shirt, you know. Um, and, and all the characters that are kind of that far to the edges of the map, um, are dressed that way, you know, versus like Maxine is like, I don't, what is that? You know, it's yeah. just, an, it's like a really amazing piece of costume, yeah. you know, that has so much like, like layers and texture and it's, it's a color you can't quite name. And, and so I, I really appreciate that, that Jen kind of saw that collaboration early on and, and, and we shared a couple of quick conversations. And again, the show moved so quickly that it was kind of like, I see you, I like that, good, high five. <laughs> you know, keep Let's going. Let's keep going, yeah. yeah, yeah. But she, I love Nadia's red shirt too. That the shirt red shirt, yeah. So great. Yeah. All right, well, uh, that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you so much. Please join Thanks. me in thanking Michael again.